The climactic moment in a trial is when the jury returns the verdict. In the case for Christ, it happened for me on November the 8th of 1981. I spent nearly two years of my life entering into this investigation as an atheist, checking out the evidence for Jesus Christ. I interviewed experts, I checked documents, I did all sorts of research into the issue of whether or not there is credibility to the Christian faith. And on November 8, 1981, I came to my verdict. In my book, The Case for Christ, I recount that journey. In fact, I recreate that journey. And I go out and I interview 13 leading scholars and experts so that it's not Lee Strobel giving you the evidence for Christianity. It is leading scholars with doctorates from places like uh, Brandeis and Princeton and Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, these are some of the leading experts in the world on the question of who Jesus Christ really is. And so in the book, I systematically set forth the evidence that I personally found convincing. Are the eyewitness accounts that make up the Gospels about Jesus Christ, are they accurate? Well, I subjected them to eight different tests of evidence, and I walked away convinced that there is every reason to believe that they preserve for us reliable information about the life, teachings, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then I looked at the question of whether or not these writings were reliably preserved for us through time. How do we know that the text wasn't altered in some way? And through the evidence that we've already discussed, I came to the conclusion that they are 99.5% free of error. And no doctrine at all hinges on any disputed passage in the New Testament. Then I looked at the question of whether or not there was evidence for Jesus outside the Bible. And Dr. Gary Habermas, in his book, Verdict of History, has shown that there are more than 100 facts about the life, teachings, miracles, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in writings outside the Bible that corroborate what the Bible has to say. Now, granted, not all of these are are equally um, good or, or excellent in terms of their historical value. They vary around the board, but they do provide some corroboration that help us see that there is evidence outside the Bible that, that confirms what it is that the New Testament tells us about Jesus. Then I looked at the archaeological evidence. I interviewed Dr. John McRae, the archaeologist who'd studied at the University of Chicago, who'd personally conducted digs in the Middle East, and he was able to show that time after time after time, the writers of the New Testament, take Luke, for example. Luke is a meticulous historian who is very careful in recording things to be extremely accurate so that when archaeology investigates the things that can be investigated that Luke wrote, we see that he was right time after time after time, leading to this question. If Luke was that careful about the minute details of what he wrote, why would we not think that he wouldn't be equally careful in writing about the really important things, like whether or not Jesus really returned from the dead. Then I looked at the question of whether or not Jesus was really convinced that he was the Son of God. And when I interviewed Dr. Ben Witherington, the great expert in that area, he was able to show from material about Jesus that could not have been tainted by any legendary development, that Jesus certainly believed that he was transcendent, that he was eternal, that he would judge all mankind, that he was divine. Was Jesus crazy in making that claim? No. Dr. Gary Collins, a great and eminent psychologist, said that his investigation of Jesus Christ, his teachings, his life, his personality, show that there's no sign whatsoever of mental imbalance or of mental illness. Did Jesus fulfill the attributes of God? I went to the great theologian, Dr. D.A. Carson, one of the most respected theologians in North America. And he was able to show that all of the attributes that make God God are true of Jesus Christ. Then what about whether or not Jesus fit the prophetic uh, fingerprint? In other words, did Jesus fulfill the prophecies written hundreds of years before he was born um, on this planet? Uh, did he fulfill them against all mathematical odds and thus establish that he is the Messiah who was predicted and foretold in the Old Testament of the Bible. Well, I believe that 
even the use of mathematics can show that against every odd, Jesus Christ fulfilled dozens and dozens and dozens of these Old Testament prophecies to establish that he is the Messiah, the Savior of Israel and the world. Then I looked at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, starting first, first with his crucifixion. Could it be that Jesus never really died in the cross, but that he was put into a tomb still alive and he was revived by the damp, cool air of the tomb and resuscitated, but not resurrected? Well, I interviewed Dr. Alexander Metherell, who established as one of the leading experts in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, a medical doctor, that there is no way whatsoever in his medical opinion, and this has been backed up by an article also in the Journal of the American Medical Association, there is no way whatsoever that Jesus could have come down from the cross alive. And then, of course, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we looked at the evidence for that, the empty tomb. Everybody agreed the tomb was empty. The appearances of Jesus Christ, the eyewitnesses who saw him, more than 515 eyewitnesses, the early testimony about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, so early that it could not have been the product of legend and mythology growing up many years after Jesus lived. I put all of that together, and I had to reach a verdict. And I remember the day, November the 8th of 1981, when I asked the questions that you may remember we asked at the beginning of this series. Was the collection of evidence thorough? I really believe it was. Secondly, what is the best possible explanation for the totality of the evidence? Well, based on the evidence that I had seen during my investigation, I concluded on that day that in light of this monumental amount of information pointing so convincingly toward Jesus Christ being the Son of God, it would have required more faith for me to maintain my atheism than to become a follower of Jesus Christ. In other words, the most logical, the most rational step that I could take would be to take a step of faith in the same direction that the evidence is pointing and put my trust in Jesus Christ as a forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life. I remember what happened on that day when I came to the conclusion that the evidence is powerful and compelling about the identity of Jesus Christ. I was kind of stuck. <laughs> I wasn't sure what do I do now that I really believe this is true? And I remember opening the Bible to a verse that somebody had pointed out to me once before. John 1, 12. Listen to the active verbs in this verse as I recite it to you, because they form an equation of what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ. That verse says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. So if you take those verbs out, they form an equation. Believe plus receive equals become. What does that mean? What does it mean to believe? Based on the evidence, I was convinced, and I believe, that Jesus Christ is the one and only Son of God. He authenticated it through his miraculous resurrection from the dead. But that isn't enough just to believe it. That verse says, believe plus receive. At a moment in time, I had to appropriate what Jesus did in the cross to pay for the sins of the world. I had to appropriate that, receive that, to pay for my sin. I had to receive Jesus Christ personally as the forgiver of my sin and the leader of my life. In light of the evidence for who he is, that was the, that was the most logical thing I could possibly do. And when I believed and I received, then I became a child of God. I became adopted into the family of God forever. And the Bible says that when you do that, when you open your heart to Jesus Christ in that way, when you then invite his Holy Spirit to lead your life, when you endeavor to lead a life that is in alignment with how God wants us to live, God begins to change us. And I began to see in my life changes in my character, in my values, in my attitude, in my philosophy, in my worldview, in my relationships, in my marriage, in all areas of my life, over time, not overnight, but over time, I began to see changes as God began to work in my life. Some of this isn't easy for me to talk about. Um, 
I lived a very immoral life. I lived a self-destructive life. I lived a self-absorbed life. I lived a drunken life. I lived a profane life. That was who I was. Um, I did things that I couldn't, I don't even want to tell you about. Because I'd be too humiliated to come on television and disclose to you some of the ugliness that had been true of my life. But I'll give you a snapshot, maybe, that will tell you something about it. I had a little girl still have her she's older now but at that time she was about five years old when I gave my life to Jesus Christ and all this little girl had ever known in her life was a dad who was angry I remember coming home one night from work and kicking a hole in our living room wall just in anger over over life frustration and I'd come home drunk or I wouldn't come home at all and the ugly truth about me is my little girl sometimes you know, she'd be playing with some toys in the living room, and I'd come through the front door at the end of a day, and she'd hear her dad come home, and she would just very quietly gather her toys and move into her room and close the door because she didn't want to be in the same room as me because she didn't know what I was going to be like. Was I going to be drunk? Was I going to be angry? That's the truth about what I was like. And then... I received Jesus Christ, as I described a few minutes ago. And he began to change my life. So much so that five months or so after I became a Christian, and my little girl began to see in her dad changes in his character and values and so. Based on what she'd seen in my life, my little girl came up to my wife one day and she said, Mommy, I want God to do for me what he's done for dad. And at age five, my little girl, who'd never studied the case for Christ, who'd never interviewed an expert, who'd never read a book, just said, in effect, if this is what God does to human beings, if this is how he changes them, sign me up. Why would I want, not want that in my life? And now my daughter's 23 years old. And she's in the ministry now. And my son, based on the changes he saw in his dad, give his life to Jesus too. And now he's entering into the ministry. Their lives have been changed. And they said, Dad, there's a whole bunch of people who still don't understand the reality of the case for Christ. And we want to spend our lives helping people understand. They can change. They can be different. God can lead their lives. God can forgive their guilt. God can lift the condemnation off their shoulders. Because Jesus died as their substitute that they might have eternal life with him. That as true as the resurrection for Jesus Christ is, that resurrection is going to be true for every single follower of Jesus someday, and will spend eternity in heaven with God. And now what about you? What about you? What is your verdict in the case for Christ? you got to reach one at some point. Maybe you don't have enough information yet. Maybe you need the book, The Case for Christ. I hope it'll be a tool in your hands to help you get the details. This isn't Lee Strobel giving you the evidence. These are eminent scholars who I cross-examine and pose the tough questions I had when I was an atheist and force them to defend the faith and give cogent reasons why Christianity is true. Maybe that would be a tool. There are other tools out there. But the Bible says in the Old Testament and the New Testament, if you sincerely seek God, you're going to find him. And so that's what I'd encourage you to do. With an open heart, with an open mind, check out the evidence for the case for Christ. Investigate it yourself. Do what I did. Spend the time to check it out. Because I have confidence if you will do that, you'll emerge with the same kind of information that I had. Information that points powerfully and compellingly toward the reality of Christianity. That Christianity is not based on legend and make-believe and wishful thinking. It is based on a factual, historical foundation. It can be investigated. It can be checked out. I invite you to do it. But I gotta tell you, at some point, you gotta reach a verdict. You gotta come to a conclusion. 
I can't prove to you that Jesus is God. You can't prove to me that he isn't God. But we can look at evidence, and the evidence can point in a direction powerfully. What is logical and rational is for you to come to a conclusion, to take a step of faith, the same direction the evidence is pointing. And everything inside of me is cheering for you, cheering for you, that you would find the faith, the, the, the case for Christianity to be strong and compelling, and that you would have the courage to find a verdict in favor of Jesus Christ. It's been my pleasure to be with you, to give you just tidbits, just an overview of the case for Christ. And my prayers are with you as you embark as a juror in your own case for Christ. God bless you.